Good day, everyone. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the third edition of the ESAT Innovation Talks today. And this talk is going to focus on lessons learned from designing and implementing innovation challenges in the UN and beyond. My name is Johanna Joachim, and I'm from the UN Innovation Network. Um, please allow me to just share a couple of words on the Innovation Network. Um, it is an informal network of UN innovators from across the UN. The network focuses on sharing knowledge and expertise, connecting colleagues, working on similar topics, and promoting innovation across the UN. Um, we have launched an innovation toolkit and aim to promote innovation overall, but also specifically focus on um, topics such as blockchain, behavioral science, virtual reality, and hopefully very soon strategic foresight. And uh, we at the Innovation Network, we are so thrilled that IFAD is such an active supporter and contributor to the Innovation Network. So I wanted to say a big thank you to IFAD for first of all being that, such an active player, and for inviting me to moderate this event today. And of course, for putting together such a fascinating discussion on such an important topic where we can all learn from each other and exchange experiences. And to kick off the discussion, I'd like to invite Edward Gallagher to share, ref, uh, share a few reflections on IFAD's innovation journey to date with us and the innovation talks. Edward is the lead officer in the change delivery and innovation unit at IFAD. Edward, thanks for joining us. Over to you for a few introductory comments, please. Thank you. Thank you, Johanna. Hello, colleagues, partners, and members of the IFAD Innovation Network, and welcome to the third edition of the IFAD Innovation Talks. As Johanna said, if you are joining us today for the first time, the IFAD Innovation Talks are a Mama. series of monthly meetings that feature innovative approaches, tools, products, and services developed either by IFAD, its partners, or the members of the IFAD Network. Last week, IFAD delivered a training in partnership with the D Groups Foundation to help users learn how best to navigate the platform that hosts the IFAD Innovation Network. We are looking into more trainings as well as networking cafes as this was highlighted by people to Gladys as an area of interest. Uh, you've already met our moderator, Johanna, the manager of the UN Innovation Network. And as Johanna said, IFAD is a very active member of the UN Innovation Network. And we always try really hard to contribute to its work across the different areas of innovation it pursues. For example, from behavioral sciences, the dissemination of the UN Innovation Toolkit, to knowledge sharing on how IFAD can leverage the use of technologies to deliver results on IFAD's mandate key, the rural poor. I would also like to welcome the speakers and panelists today, which is comprised of our Moonshot for Development partners from ITB Lab, the World Food Program and Innovation Accelerator, and Asian Development Bank, as well as VentureWell, and to thank them for taking part so willingly, particularly for what is an uncomfortable time for those joining from America. I'd also like to thank the behind the scenes CDI team who have organized today. Now, moving to the content of today and why this topic is so important for IFAD. In January 2019, IFAD established the Change Delivery and Innovation Unit, or CDI for short, where Gladys and I work, with the objective to help the fund deliver better results quicker by embedding a culture of change, enhanced delivery, and innovation. We also support the organization with ongoing internal reforms to ensure IFAD maximizes its contribution to the 2030 Agenda. Also, from mid-2019 and running throughout 2020, CDI launched the first internal IFAD Innovation Challenge to identify ideas to solve known problems. We had 50 proposals submitted and nine teams were funded to develop a prototype right in the middle of the global pandemic. At the end of 2020, CDI did an evaluation of the Innovation Challenge and we drew lessons and also proposed next steps to support certain ideas and to establish internal and external partnerships to scale up the innovations. Finally, this year, ECDI will be delivering an innovation operating model to continue supporting the organization to foster innovation, particularly on the ground. A key focus will be the dissemination of knowledge and the importance of establishing partnerships to scale up innovations. So from an EFAD point of view, today's event is perfectly timed. So I'm particularly looking forward to sharing and learning from others on our innovation challenge experiences. I look forward to the speech by Irena, our keynote speaker today, and to the dialogue with our panelists and, to, and our audience, and to hear Dominic's wrap up. And back to you, Johanna. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Edward, for sharing these reflections on what has happened at IFAD over the past years. It's been a, a, a rapid journey. Congratulations just from my side also for what you've achieved to date. Um, and I'm excited to see where this road is going to take you. And indeed, now it's my pleasure to introduce you to our keynote speaker for the day. Irene Arias Hoffman is the CEO of the Innovation Lab of the Inter-American Development, uh, Development Bank. And the lab mobilizes resources to develop innovation projects that have the potential to scale 
in Latin America and the Caribbean specifically. Um, Irene has over two decades of experience investing in emerging markets. She has worked uh, at the World Bank and the IFC prior to joining the IDB lab. Um, so she really brings a treasure chest of experiences and we're really happy to have her join us. Irene, thank you for being here and very much looking forward to your keynote. Thank you, Johanna, and of course, Gladys, Edward, and, and uh, all the partners of this amazing innovation network. Um, I'm also very happy to see many familiar faces uh, among the panelists and speakers um, and, and find these spaces to share knowledge and experience, make our work better uh, and more impactful together. Um, I think the more we engage um, in these type of exchanges, the more we are systematic in the way we generate and share our knowledge together, um, the better the results. And I think that's the beauty of uh, innovation is that lessons can be shared globally. And of course, then applied in different geographies uh, with the right local adaptations um, that applies to challenges too. Um, IDB Lab uh, is the innovation lab of the IDB. And, and we have in that sense, the privilege and the responsibility to take risks that the rest of the organization uh, can't easily take. Um, our value proposition includes financing knowledge and connections, and we're working to push the envelope on innovation to achieve more inclusion in Latin America and the Caribbean. So in order to do that, um, we stay closely connected with the industries around five verticals that we focus on, one of them, of course, is agriculture, and, and that's what brings us together with IFAT here. And uh, we work very closely with innovators. It's like having one foot at the IDB and one foot with the innovation industry uh, in all the 26 countries so that we understand the challenge, their challenges. We support the journey of innovators and entrepreneurs along the way, and we allow them to scale and, and help them align with uh, development goals. So. We work on a continuum also on fi of financial instruments, uh, from, from grants to prototype cutting edge technologies to direct equity for startups and fueling the venture capital industry and development, development oriented capital and knowledge. Um, we've been around for three decades and we have adopted innovation challenges as one of the tools that we use, one to stay connected to the industry, but particularly to generate com a competitive funnel of projects um, so that we also leverage partnerships and raise awareness to development challenges. Um, we use challenges as a testing ground. Um, challenges in themselves can be considered um, sometimes proof of concepts when we are moving the needle on new frontiers. We are about to launch one on silver economy, for example. And um, we've used them in different contexts and industries, and also to deepen our portfolio in some countries where our coverage was not as deep. Um, examples, Better Together, um, that was a challenge uh, for uh, migrants, Venezuelan migrants and their host communities in nine countries together with USAID. It ran for over a year. Um, over 1,200 proposals. Um, we supported directly 30 of them. Um, we also ran a COVID challenge uh, for the medical emergency at the beginning of the pandemic. 500 proposals, we supported 30 of them. Um, and this was more of a curated one. And another example is beyond tourism. Thinking ahead of the need not to be just uh, thinking of the emergency of the pandemic, but also thinking of the recovery um, and knowing how tourism is critical for some of the economies in the region. We launched that challenge together with the UN World Tourism Organization. Um, over 12, uh, 200 proposals in, in, um, in 15 countries, and uh, many of them are already delivering those uh, delivering results. Four lessons I'd like to share very briefly. One, it serves really to democratize access to financing, uh, mainly for developed uh, for less developed countries and for organizations that are less familiar uh, in terms of how to work with um, uh, development um, finance organizations. They are not a solution for everything and we should certainly avoid doing it for innovation theater, but they can be a great tool for effective allocation of resources. Number two, um, 
challenges allowed uh, allowed to be proactive in generating pipeline and new projects in countries where traditional sourcing strategies have been less effective. Uh, number three, um, what happens during the challenge requires methodology. Uh, what happens after the challenge is even more important and requires even more methodology um, and so that we can we can be successful and we reach scale. They have helped us by doing that to generate a portfolio of projects around particular priorities to identify the most innovative solutions and really move the direction of the ship in a new frontier. Uh, we've done it for blue economy, for example, in the Caribbean, and we've done it also for talent and uh, through a challenge uh, for boot camps in the region. And number four, uh, it really helps us uh, position, improve coverage of small countries, identify new partners, and operationalize the way we work with them. And um, with that, um, I would like to uh, thank everyone and um, and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irena, for um, these reflections and for setting a foundation for our discussion ahead and indeed for the entire session. Um, fully agree with you know the emphasis on uh, partnerships in running innovation challenges, and that they're a fantastic way to deepen our understanding uh, of new areas we want to embark on. But of course, they're not a panacea. So very much looking forward to. Um, diving deeper into these reflections with our panel. And I'm very happy to introduce you to our panel today. We have members from the UN and beyond, uh, as Edward uh, alluded to at the beginning. First of all, we have Gratis Morales. She's a senior innovation advisor at IFAT. Then we're joined by Hila Cohen, also based in Rome at the World Food Programme. Hila is the head of business development at WFP's Innovation Accelerator. Actually not based in Rome, um, but WFP of course is based in Rome. Uh, we have Marc Lepage. He's the principal specialist, principal IT specialist at the Asian Development Bank and previously an innovation advisor for UNDP. And then finally, we have Phil Weilerstein, president and CEO of VentureWell. So thanks to all of you for joining us today. And we look forward to hearing your experiences with running innovation challenges. And to set the scene, could I maybe ask all of you to tell us a bit more about your approach to the approach that your organization has used to designing and implementing innovation challenges? And uh, maybe given that it's an EFAT event, Gladys, can we maybe start with you? Thank you, Joanna. Thank you so much for being here uh, with us today. And thank you for, uh, to all the audience and uh, the partners that have joined us today. So uh, we're using the lessons drawn from the evaluation of the 2019-2020 Innovation Challenge to design our innovation pipeline and the next innovation challenge. Our approach is a hybrid between the Silicon Valley approach and the UN strategy partnerships, architecture, culture, and evaluation model, model or the space model. We will enhance the use of the lean launch pad approach in the prototyping and prototyping products and will enforce also a discovery driven and user centric approach. The development of a lean business model canvas will be mandatory as uh, it forces teams to identify key elements in the design and development of their idea in a concise and effective way. We will also encourage teams uh, to develop uh, prototypes to collect feedback and find out first and foremost if anyone cares really about their idea before the organization or teams decide to devote time and resources in the development of uh, prototypes. So uh, I've, I've talked about two different concepts, which is prototyping prior to prototyping. And that's, uh, that's going to be our first stage in the innovation pathway. Risk is being mit mitigated now by the use of checkpoints or stage gate assessments to evaluate progress. And uh, we are also now requiring teams to pitch their ideas to key stakeholders to determine resource allocation which uh, forces teams to make sure that the solution that they're proposing and developing truly responds to the needs of the end user and beneficiary, which is key to effect, that the solutions that we develop, that we support, and that we dedicate resources to are really addressing the needs of our beneficiaries. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Gladys. Two such basic and really fundamental concepts in innovation. Let's make sure that our, uh, our ideas are ad actually addressing the user's needs and that we involve key stakeholders to see their support. Fantastic reflections. Hila, over to you maybe for um, experiences from designing innovation challenges at WFP. 
Uh, thank you, everyone, and thank you uh, for inviting me to this uh, interesting session today. Um, so at the World Food Program, we launched an innovation accelerator five years ago, and it was designed um, to fit the operational uh, DNA of um, WFP. Um, the way that we run innovation challenges is, is the, the, the following, and then I'll explain the why behind it. So what we do is that we invite teams to apply to our program. They can do it on our website, innovation.wfp.org. Um, and we look for startups or NGOs or internal teams for WFP. Um, and they, again, also can apply on our website. Um, and, uh, and then we invite teams to come. We look at all the applications. And we actually also matching element, which is critical for our success. Um, a team that comes to our boot camp and then potentially will get funding from us has to have them within WFP. So we at the accelerator are the matchers between uh, ideas and problems in the field. And even if we see an amazing team, but it doesn't, there's no client within WFP to pilot that innovation, we probably wouldn't work with that team. Um, we run a five day bootcamp. Um, in the past, it was in person. Now we, since in the last year, we've done this um, virtually. Um, we bring experts from within WFP to mentor the startups that we select or the teams that we select. Um, and we also bring um, experts from the private sector because I think different teams have different uh, knowledge and expertise needs. We focus on a human-centered design approach. And then after our boot camp, we do have a pitch event where teams have three minutes to pitch their ideas in front of a, of, um, a very interesting audience, including donors, other UN agencies, and other uh, investors. And then after that, we give funding of up to $100,000 to team of, as part of our sprint program. And uh, we don't take equity, um, but and that the funding helps them to fund the pilot in the field with WFP. And also our lead, latest part of our work is also our scale-up enablement program, where we have identified that there's specific challenges for scaling of innovation. And, and, uh, and that's the root of our goal and our work. And so that's why we have all these uh, different activities that we do as part of our challenges. All right. Thank you, Hila. Um, what a journey the Accelerator has been on at this stage. I want to say thank you for also running a bootcamp with Union a couple of years ago. Most of the ideas from that bootcamp actually went ahead and scaled. So that speaks for the methodology and the approach and really exciting to see you adding a scale up enablement program to it. Um, Mark, any reflections from the ADB? Thanks, you, and I, and I also want to thank the organizer, uh, Gladys, particularly for uh, inviting uh, me uh, to talk a little bit about the ADB experience with the uh, open innovation. Um, the open innovation platform at uh, ADB has an interesting uh, starting point. I in a way, there's two starting points. Uh, one is from the uh, corporate wide innovation trajectory. Uh, and the other one is from the IT department where I sit. I work with the digital innovation unit. And uh, when the new digital innovation um, program, which is called the ADB Sandbox program, was initiated in, in 2018, it turns out that our colleague from the ADB Knowledge Department were also interested to launch an open innovation platform. So we've uh, joined forces uh, with uh, you know, the, same, the same objective to source uh, innovative uh, solutions uh, from, from the crowd. Um, so we've, um, from the get-go, had a, a program-wide approach by launching a, a platform that would allow us to launch multiple challenges, not just a sort of individual ones. Um, so the procurement of the service uh, took place very quickly when the Sandbox program was launched, and that was one of the first activity we did. And the, the soft launch of the platform uh, challenges.adb.org was, was done mid-2019. Uh, initially, like colleagues were saying it was a mixed approach of online and face-to-face -face, uh, challenges hackathon uh, with three specific challenges initially launched one that was fairly internal about providing ADB employees with a digital wallet uh, another one that was much more external around digital skills for today's workforce and another one that was very sector specific around uh, future proofing for the water crisis and those three initial challenges uh, that were launched are a good illustration of the program-wide approach. Um, like colleagues uh, from other organizations, those uh, challenges are used to source uh, uh, innovation. Um, seed fund is allocated for all our challenges uh, so that we can pilot within the ADB context the solution that is uh, presented. 
Uh, typically, we get uh, between uh, three to 500 participants, uh, and we've got two or three levels of filtering, depending on the, the level of refinement that we expect from the, the solution that will be submitted. And uh, we've been uh, having very successful challenges with some uh, ongoing interesting results. Over, please. Thank you, Mark, for sharing really interesting reflections. I love the idea of an internal digital wallet. Um, and I have to say, I have don't think I've ever heard anyone say that procurement took place quickly. So congrats for that. Uh, it seems like uh, there was some innovation in the procurement department, which is also interesting. Um, finally, Phil, I'd like to come to you. What are your reflections from VentureWorld perspective on running innovation challenges? Thank you, Joanna, and, and thank you uh, for having us here. Uh, so VentureWell is a little different than the organizations you've heard from so far. We're a NGO based in the US with a mission to stimulate and support innovation and entrepreneurship in science and technology. And we do that by focusing on the, the creation of innovation pathways for scientists and researchers in both higher education and research institutions that enable high social and environmental impact innovations to move from the very earliest idea stage to scale and impact. We've been at this for 25 years, uh, both building and running challenges uh, that we uh, managed in their entirety and define, as well as working with others who've defined challenges to provide support, training, programming, and uh, sort of acceleration and lift to the teams that go through that. Um, our work spans 30 countries around the world, and we've worked with thousands of innovators over the years uh, developing scalable solutions in food and water technologies, ag tech, med tech, uh, energy materials, and, and beyond that. Um, we have a portfolio of work as well that goes beyond just supporting the, the innovators on their pathway to actually helping to create pathways within institutions. Um, and we do that through capacity building and institutional transformation programs that really try to work at an ecosystem level. And I, I think this is important because the work that we do is always very connected and tries to help build networks. One of the earlier panelists mentioned the importance for folks who are not coming from technology rich environments to be able to engage our programs, help them to build their networks and move forward. And they start with the idea stage. We use a lean approach and customer discovery, focusing on identifying compelling challenges and solutions exploring the stakeholder needs, uh, doing that in a way that brings a strong focus on uh, data from stakeholders and an analysis of that data and other market uh, data sources to articulate a compelling value proposition and a scalable model based on that. Then to vet that and validate it and begin to move towards uh, acquiring resources to scale, develop and build it out. And finally, to uh, get really a healthy start to uh, the onward scaling and addressing impact where you can actually see measurable global impact from the innovations. Thank you so much for sharing that, Phil. And uh, I specifically uh, really enjoyed the focus on building an ecosystem and networks within your organization. That is so important. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so really interesting to hear from all of you about the different ways that you're running your innovation challenges and are tailoring them um, to your specific organizational context. Um, before we go into kind of the second round of questions, I just wanted to share a small reminder that we are taking questions from the audience after, um, after this short panel. Please feel free to put them in the Q&A box and that Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, you can see that you can also upvote questions that other people have asked and that will really help us prioritize um, the ones that we take. So I really encourage you to do that. Um, so now coming back to you, the panel, um, few things I think in innovation are as important as talking openly about what has worked and what hasn't worked, sharing experiences. So I'd be really curious to hear from you, what lessons have you taken away from these different approaches? And could you maybe share like a couple, three or four um, key lessons learned from designing and running innovation challenges. And um, maybe let's start with you, Hila, this time. Um, sure. Um, so I want, I hear a few learnings um, that we've had over the last five years at the World Food Program Innovation Accelerator. I think the first one is always understand what is, why is your organization running an innovation challenge? What is the problem that you're trying to solve? I think this is like, sometimes we skip this question. And I think it's actually the most critical ones. 
Is it a visibility question? Are you actually interested to work with startups or with NGOs? Like what is the value that this will bring you? On the flip side, I think it's important also to be very clear on what is the value that you're bringing to the actors that you're opening your doors to. Um, because these are sometimes smaller teams, younger teams, or, or that are more, uh, have a more cash challenges because they're a startup. And, and they should also be aware what they're spending their time on if they're uh, resource uh, limited. So I think knowing what you're looking for and what you're offering and being very transparent and not over promising, I think is uh, very important. Um, the second thing is um, also think about um, what, if you're bringing startups into your organization, what are the touch points you're creating for them? So again, are, is it only cash? Is it only mentoring? Is it the right mentoring? Are you actually putting, and it takes time to do these things. It's not like, uh, you know, um, sometimes you observe that the team needs certain mentoring needs or certain things to strength. They might, the team itself might observe other needs. So also putting time um, into um, observing, uh, you know, the, the needs and ensuring that you're providing them. And the third part, I think is also, you need to decide how you mitigate risk in the selection. We have a very structured approach um, there's every application that we get, and we've got over 6,000 in the last five years. We, there's at least two reviewers, if not three, for every application. Then the long list and the short list gets approved um, by our internal advisory board that's made of managers outside, inside of WFP. And then also the boot camp is another phase for us to get to know the teams before we decide to give them up to $100,000. So also decide what is your way of selecting teams and how you manage your risks. Over. Thank you, Hila. So important. Be clear on what the problem is you're solving. Make sure you're selecting the right teams and be clear on what you're offering after the innovation challenge. That is a super important lesson and it can be so easy to just get carried away in running the challenge and forget about the so what afterwards. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Phil, can I come to you? What are your experiences and key lessons? Yeah. Learned? So some key things that we've learned. Um, the first is to put people first. Uh, you know, develop the programs in a way that cultivate uh, the individuals who are participating in that program's entrepreneurial mindset, their skills, and importantly, their network. Um, work that we do is always experiential and is always based in the ideas that the innovators have uh, brought in and designed so that whether they succeed or fail with that particular idea, they leave the experience prepared for future success. Uh, second is to tailor the support to the innovators in, in ways that meet their needs. We often and are, are almost always working with scientific founders, but often with people who are relatively new to the entrepreneurship process and even the language. And so enabling them to both become uh, comfortable in that environment and then providing the success and filling the gaps that they have in their knowledge. Um, and that innovation really doesn't occur in a vacuum. So uh, as I mentioned before, you really need to build the connections, networks at multiple levels and make sure that the people who are participating in the program as contributors, your mentors and so forth are also doing that because it over time will strengthen all of the programming. Uh, and finally, it, it's really critical to have objective measures of progress even at a very early stage. So we've developed a uh, tool we call the Venture Development Framework uh, my colleague Christ Christina Tamer uh, developed this framework and it um, enables us to understand how the teams are progressing even as they're moving backwards because the process of developing an innovative, an innovative idea involves maybe technical progress while you have business setbacks and pivots. So the, the six dimensions that we're looking at there are the team and venture structures, are the people involved, you know, coming together, the structure of the venture, the governance, et cetera, the innovation itself and the technology, the development of it, the prototyping, progressing, uh, you know, as it iterates and moving towards something that's that's scalable and, and maybe manufacturable, are, is intellectual property being developed? And that can be in various forms. Is there an increased understanding of the market? Is there a sophistication and accumulation of evidence to support the, um, the theories that the idea is based in? And then a business model. Is there a business model? Is it being expanded? And finally, are there resources uh, being accumulated and is the social capital to advance those resources being collected in advance even of the funding? So if you wanna learn more about that, uh, it's on our website and I'd be interested in talking to folks who wanna learn more about our work. 
And uh, so let's, uh, uh, given that I'm the moderator, I have the privilege of saying that I'm very interested in talking about your work and I would love to know more. So I'll be following up on that for sure. And I hope other people find it interesting as well. Uh, thank you also for the reminder to really be user-centered in the innovation support we are offering. It's not just about teaching our, um, or, or emphasizing um, to colleagues who want to innovate that they should put the user first, but the reminder that we should also be doing that, very important. Um, let's go to Mark from the ADB. What are your biggest lessons learned from running innovation challenges? Thanks, Joanna. And, and of course, I agree with what the, the previous speakers uh, mentioned. Uh, just, just to add a couple of lessons learned from, from our side. Uh, one important one is, around, is about picking a, a like-minded service provider. Um, challenges.adb.org is powered by Agorai, which is a global company focusing on uh, open innovation challenge. They have a strong footprint in Asia, which is one of the reasons we've picked them. And, and Agorai has been not only a, a service provider, but a, a partner for many of our challenges, going way beyond the contractual uh, arrangements we, we have with them. Uh, for example, by disseminating some of our challenges to their database of several million talents. So that's that been key. Um, the second lesson learned is around, around designing and managing those challenge. Uh, pretty quickly, uh, we had to put in, in place a solid dedicated team that could provide support for uh, the many different challenges that we were uh, running. And, and the support comes from different angles. Um, the, the design, of course, of uh, challenges is, uh, is something that we all know needs to be uh, very carefully done, but also the handholding from the platform perspective, uh, the mentoring, uh, and all this. So the, the dedicated team has been uh, very useful for us. Uh, the other one, I think, to, to echo what Hila mentioned, is to provide clear value added to the participants. For, for many of them, it's, it's not the seed fund that, are, that we are providing that attract them, but it's the the value or the opportunity to pilot a solution with, uh, with ADB, often in the context of a developing country that is, that is attractive and that's, uh, that's important. And then the, maybe the, the last and if not the most important lesson for is what's next? You know, after you run a challenge is the implementation uh, of the pilot and to be able to demonstrate not only to the participant and the team that's been selected, of course, that we're serious about running it, but from a you know, organization perspective that this is a, a way, a very good way to attract a very innovative solutions um, and to, to be able to, to demonstrate this by, you know, showcasing, uh, et cetera. So that's, uh, that's for me, the, the key lesson learned. Over and back to you, Joanna. Thank you, Mark. Excellent lessons learned that we're adding to the list. Um, and of course, it's so easy to always just say innovators need funding to turn their ideas into reality. But you're absolutely right when saying it's often the technical expertise that's really critical to help advance ideas. And uh, I dare say in the UN context, it's often time as well. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Really much appreciated. Um, Gladys, giving you the floor, what are your lessons learned from running challenges and EFAD? Thank you so much, Johanna. So being the last is it's a bit difficult because then uh, most of the things have been said, but uh, I would like to focus on internal innovation challenges because IFAD has run innovation challenges in the regions and also hackathons, but uh, the, the experiences there tend to be different from this time we run the first internal innovation challenge at, uh, at IFAD and uh, that has been quite, uh, quite different from the other experiences and I think we, I've seen some, some questions there in the, in the chat where people say, okay, you guys are talking a lot about successes, well, what about failures? Well, you know, designing an internal innovation challenge uh, was very, very challenging for IFAD. So one of the, one of the things that uh, we failed to recognize is that people, uh, our colleagues at IFAD that were, you know, the winners of this innovation challenge were um, in the middle of a pandemic. They were uh, extremely talented teams. And I have to recognize the, not only the talent, but the dedication of all these teams to, to their ideas. But at the same time, they were in the middle of a pandemic and they were extremely uh, charged with, with uh, extra work to try to address all the needs, all the extra needs of our of IFAD's beneficiaries. On top of that, they were trying to respond to the, to the development of, of their ideas. And uh, that really, you know, the, the lesson from that is that we need to ensure that our innovators have the time to dedicate to their ideas. Because if they don't have the time, if they have uh, multiple responsibilities, then it becomes really, really hard for them to actually pursue their ideas. Uh, very, key, very key component also is that we also need to ensure that 
when we run these uh, these challenges internally or externally, we need to make sure that we have that technical support, but also uh, the, the contribution and the partnership from internal key corporate internal units. I'm really happy to hear from you, Mark, that you have been successful at procurement, but uh, sometimes you know those processes are not so easy for all the organizations. So we're also learning from that. And in fact, in July, we're going to be talking about uh, during an innovation talk about um, program procurement, which is key when you're running innovation challenges in the field. Last, very quickly, is we also realized that the teams that have diversity, equity, and that are inclusive, they tend to develop uh, better ideas and they tend to address problems and challenges much faster. Thank you so much. Super important last point there, Gladys, inclusivity, and this is so important when we're innovating. Um, and fantastic to hear that you're deep diving into procurement. I think Hila might be a good partner in crime to discuss this because she's had a lot of experience trying to uh, hack the procurement process uh, at WFP. So I hope you can connect on that one. Uh, lots of really great, <clears throat> sorry, food for thought. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, I always have a million questions, but it's not the time where I can ask you questions, but I'm taking the ones that uh, colleagues you have put in the Q&A box. Uh, just a reminder, we're using the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Please don't put them in the chat. Um, and we really encourage you to like questions that you'd like the answers to. It helps us prioritize. Um, coming to the first question from our audience to our panel, and it's a question to everyone coming from Ginetta Guelli. And she's wondering, in your experience, how long does an innovation project in your field take from inception to implementation? So maybe quick reflections um, from the panel on this one, please. Happy to jump in. I, we, we, uh, I, I would say the minimum is typically um, at least six months. Uh, and that's for something where you know you're you're not held back by sort of material things that need to be built, uh, where it's software or something like that. Uh, but more more readily, uh, a year and a half to two years to actual like, you know, something happening at scale, uh, in the field with uh, turnover of of inventory or or um, other evidence of real business traction. Uh, but it really depends on the framework uh, being uh, pursued and. It, what kind of business models being pursued, the technology underlying it. One of the key things as they're progressing in that period is to make sure that there is continued support for the work that they're doing, that they have a good team of mentors. And if they've managed to get to the point of formalizing what they're doing, that they have formal advisors or a board that's actually helping them to steer that. Uh, even before, you know, it may seem like they, they actually need to have that full level of formality, that often is really supportive and helpful. Um, I can go ahead um, at um, in our, at our accelerator. Um, I think it also the question, what is inception, is an important one um, because we also have made a, dis a decision. Uh, usually, when it's internal teams, they may be more early stage. When we work with external startups, um, we uh, um, usually require them to have a bit more traction and results because we just know their learning curve of WFP takes a bit of time. So they at least need to have a bit of a more advanced solution, which internal teams don't have. Um, so it's usually about um, from this, let's say they're starting work with us, they can come to bootcamp. Our funding after that as part of the sprint program will be at usually it's around six months, if not more. And some projects need more longer term, uh, let's say build up time just because of uh, of, of what's what's behind behind it. But if we see we don't have results after a year, that's a question mark for us many, many times. And, and we'll need to address uh, why is it, we might think it's actually not an innovation, maybe it's something else and it shouldn't be, let's say solved in our house, over. Thank you, Hila, uh, for sharing. And I'm gonna say thank you to the panel on that question and uh, maybe move to the next because we're seeing a lot of questions coming in. We want to make sure we're covering all of them. Um, so next, a question from colleague Anne-Catherine Anne Beck, and uh, she is wondering, what are the implications of external versus internal participants in innovation challenges? What are the advantages and disadvantages there? Um, anyone care to reflect on this one? So, so I can, ju oh, I can yes, jump in here if you wish. Okay. Ahead, 
because we actually talked about this when, and because Gladys joined us during the Innovation Challenge, um, we talked about this at the very start and someone came to me and said from IFAD, if you're actually serious about the rural poor and the focus should be the rural poor, then it should actually be more external rather than an internal one. And we thought about it. And then I also saw, heard Hila talk about 5,000 applications and we looked at kind of what, what our internal capacity would be. So for our, for our first internal innovation challenge, we actually made an active decision to keep it internal because we knew we wouldn't be able to handle the kind of the demand that we might create. And then by doing that, we can kind of create and learn and, and events like today and then see how we can actually move forward. But the focus, once again, should always be the rural poor. But as I said, we had no choice at the start. We had to start small, learn how to crawl before we can walk and run. Over. If I may jump in, um, we haven't launched uh, internal uh, challenges uh, per se, but we're currently looking into it. And the way we, we see it is that for our own employees to be involved, um, it's, uh, it's more relevant when it's precisely an internal challenge. So just to illustrate, one of the, the issues we're fa facing internally is around uh, skills mapping, who does what in, in a nutshell, um, beyond the TUR and whatnot. And we think that an open innovation uh, approach could bring some interesting uh, solution. And, and we're looking at a dual or joint, this is still being designed, a trajectory with uh, ADB employees uh, you know, joining forces with startup uh, or having a parallel track would, which would then merge. Uh, but uh, yes, internal challenge is something that, that is important to us. Over. Thank you very much for the reflections. And indeed, I guess it also always depends on uh, what is the challenge trying to achieve, right? Are we trying to surface ideas that may be um, brewing around the organization? Or are we trying to bring in new expertise or new thinking into the organization? Um, so it really depends. Thank you for your reflections on that. Um, I'm going to... Uh, take a, the next question from, uh, I've lost it, um, from Carlotta, and she's wondering, how do you disseminate lessons learned, including failures from projects, uh, from pilots coming out of innovation challenges? So Johanna, uh, I'll, I'll take this one quickly because it's, it's quite easy. This is one way to do it. So uh, getting everybody together and uh, sharing the lessons from the, the different innovation challenges. The other thing that we're doing at IFAT, and, uh, but I think that's also the case with our partner agencies, is um, uh, website and developing also learning tools so that well, we can disseminate that knowledge. But most importantly is what we do before. So collecting those lessons and making sure that you're addressing both what went well and what didn't go well so that we can also, and most importantly, learn from our failures because it's, it's, it's very easy to, to tell and to congratulate ourselves for the things that went well. It's harder to recognize that some of the things that we designed with passion didn't go so well and uh, we need to improve, so. And Johanna, maybe a couple of things more here. Um, so one is to, um, again, have a systematic way of um, tracking what happens and comparing um, a the different challenges, but going beyond the numbers, because sometimes um, getting 5,000 proposals is, uh, so sometimes less is, uh, less is more. Um, and when we've run some more curated challenges, uh, the quality at entry was better. So having less to begin with uh, was, um, was actually better than uh, just having a, a lot of uh, proposals. The other is uh, we are running a fail fests um we are we have one coming up um just encouraging teams to get out and talk about their failures um not easy but we're doing it not just for challenges but um in general with other other innovation projects really good to hear Anna. i would love to hear more about this i know the world bank has done it in the past so great to see that this continue that this tradition continues at the idp lab um fascinating work fail fest very important um, let's take the next question from uh, Sanya Televich, and Sanya is wondering, how can we make sure that innovations are designed to scale? In your experience, what are the most powerful pathways to scale? Is it expansion or application um, or movement or something else? How do we make sure it's not just a localized idea, but really, uh, really goes big? Any reflections from our panel on this? I, I, I'll um, start off. I, you know, I think it, it, it requires um, 
it to be a deliberate objective from the outset. Um, it sometimes for innovators is not. Um, they're very much in love with their idea and everybody's gonna want it as soon as they know about it and they'll tell everybody else about it. So actually helping people understand we have a process we do um, uh, called strategy mapping where they have to actually figure out you know, who needs to be involved for this to scale and what does scale look like? Who are the partners involved? So before they've even tried to develop the idea, they understand the different directions, strategies, stakeholders that might need to be involved. And that's actually very critical, particularly when the um, innovator is not intending to be the lead in the scaling so that they understand who it is that needs to be really sold on wanting to take this idea to scale from the outset. And then of course, um, making sure that in the process of developing the idea, the economic scalability and the transferability are built in as really smooth and, and um, acceleratable types of mechanisms. Um, I can jump into this one. Um, and uh, we also have, if anyone's interested, we just um, uh, published our year in review and we have a few lessons learned on scaling um, in the year in review. It's on, on our front page of our website. So it's just, you'll see directly. I think one thing we, that's the most critical things for scaling is the team. And I think that's the most, sometimes like people think that in the most like innovations about the, are about the idea. We actually believe it's in a team. We actually also don't uh, receive applicants that are single people um, that just apply because there's in the innovation journeys, there's many uh, peaks, but there's all, a lot of down moments. And so we think like uh, ensuring that there's a strong team diversify different skill sets. Um, I think that's uh, very important. And I think the second thing uh, to, um, to look at scaling is really looking at is, are they solving the right problem? Because again, I think, um, are they, is the team focused? Are they addressing the most critical problem? And are they sticking to the most critical problem? Because again, what happens again in the innovation world, you can get advice from so many mentors and they can pull you and push you to all kinds of directions. And you just need to decide this is the key problem. We're going to solve it in one place. We're going to solve it in the second place, then the third place. And then we'll start also thinking that our innovation can also address other angles or other elements as well. Thank you, Hila, for sharing that. Um, fully, fully agree. Um, I would like to take one last question, which I think is very important. And it comes from Maya Peltola. And Maya's wondering, another question disappeared. Maya's wondering, what is your experience in moving from a number of innovation activities to mainstreaming innovation in the organizational culture? Super critical question. Anyone got any thoughts on this one? Um, I can jump in super quickly. I think it's, you'll have to have two, both things in, in all, almost in parallel if you're lucky. You, not, you need support from top management to enable people to have time we were, let's say also, uh, were able to get our executive director to approve this, to create a dedicated small team in the beginning. Um, and then we've, we've grown with time as we've proven our viability. Um, and I think the other element is also to find a few early adopters. I think this is very important. We can't assume that everyone likes innovation in your organization. Um, and you, you'll just need to usually to start with early adopters, show success with them. And with results, you'll be able uh, to slowly create a movement. I would say also um, uh, having a sense of urgency and having a sense of a single purpose across the organization, as it happened with the medical emergency, for example, uh, just brings people together. It just sort of institutional boundaries just kind of wash off. And we saw that and, and we we had not been able to done as much innovation with the social sector and in particular the health team, which is now a full-blown digital health team with whom we work on the public side of IDB. Uh, if he, and, and, and we did it because we were all single focused on that particular challenge. So I think we have to use these type of situations to uh, get, get things going. Uh, Johanna, if we have time, I, I would just like to say, you know, we hear the adage, that innovation needs boardroom porridge. And I, I really agree with that. You know, sometimes you need to make the difficult decisions. Sometimes you need to pull the plug on ideas that are not working, that are not delivering. Uh, but sometimes you need to support and finance ideas that uh, can, can sound or can look like 
loose shots instead of moon shots. And uh, it requires a leader, it requires a champion within the organization to say, yes, we're going with this, we need to test it because it's, it's going to represent a significant impact for, uh, for, our, uh, for our beneficiaries. And that, those are the spaces that we need to, to create. And it, it does require a leader, um, both, you know, uh, bringing that innovation from bottom up, but also a, a big supporter in senior management to say, here, you know, we're supporting you, we're giving you the money, we're giving you the technical support. Thank you, Gladys, for that reflection and for giving me a very nice segue into our next segment. Um, before I introduce our next speaker, I want to say thank you to the panel, Gladys, Hila, Mark and Phil. Thank you so much for joining and sharing your experiences with us. I hope we can make your contact details available in case anyone would like to follow up uh, after the event. And uh, I also hope there's a lot of questions still in the chat, uh, in the Q&A box that we haven't been able to get to. So I hope we can answer them now or after the event and make the answers available as well. Um, so, so thanks to the panel for sharing that with us. And using this uh, lovely segue that Glad has offered me, I'd now like to invite Dominic Ziller um, to share a few words. And Dominic is the Vice President of IFAD. Um, so talking about having senior leadership really endorse the innovation agenda. Dominic, it's great to have you. Uh, we've heard a lot of really interesting different approaches and perspectives, and I'd be very curious to hear what your reflections on the conversation were and what are your main takeaways. So, Dominic, thanks for being with us and giving you the floor. Many thanks, Johanna. And um, well, usually people, there's there's nothing nothing that people dread a lot more than um, concluding remarks after a long, long meeting. Luckily, this one was a bit shorter, so um, I hope you can bear with me for a while. Um, I think this was uh, an extraordinary meeting, very fruitful, very dense, uh, excellent time management. And I would like to thank our speakers in this session, Irene Arias from um, the Inter-American Development Bank Innovation Lab, Phil Weilerstein from VentureWell, Hila Cohen from the World Food Program Innovation Accelerator, Mark Lepage of the Asian Development Bank, and Ed Gallagher and Gladys um, from IFAD as well as um, you, Johanna, um, from the UN Innovation Network for keeping us engaged and focused on the main messages of this innovation talk. I think you all have contributed to advance our thinking and learning on how we can design and implement innovation challenges. Um, in the end, our goal is always to deliver better and more impactful results. And for that, innovation plays a crucial role. One common lesson that we have heard from all the speakers is that innovation must bring value and transformation to the work that our development agencies do. We also heard um, um, a lot on the importance of measuring results in innovation and measuring them in a different way than how we traditionally evaluate and measure progress and results. One way to, to measure and to mitigate risks is to run multiple projects at the same time and then develop tools how to compare them, how to discern winning ideas from failing ideas. We've just heard a lot uh, from, from Gladys about uh, the adage of uh, fail fast, but um, also that um, there is a certain danger if you kill ideas too soon that might have become a hit if uh, you had given them a chance to further develop. On the other side, if, if you keep betting money on losing horses for too long, you will also subtract resources and opportunities from the potentially winning ideas. So that is, I think, uh, one issue where we really need to reflect a bit more upon how we can make decisions about uh, which ideas to support, which ideas to sunset. We heard um, how some of the agencies are using uh, evaluation tools to assess progress and results, and also about the use of uh, frequent uh, stage gate assessments or checkpoints um, to continue funding ideas that uh, promise return on investment and also on when to pull the plug, as you just uh, as said, Gladys, from those that don't. We also heard about uh, having a discovery-driven and user-centric approach that uh, helps uh, developers and funders to see to it that the projects do really respond to the needs of the end users and that they are effectively delivering a solution to the problem that, are, that they are set up to solve in the first place and not just a nice uh, answer to a problem that nobody has. Pulling the plug, I think it's rarely that um, people like to do it. It's uh, seldom easy. Um, so designing a systematic model that focuses on evidence-based decision-making and the opportunity costs of not failing fast enough 
is key if we want to ensure that we really learn from failure and disseminate the knowledge for the benefit of our organizations and beneficiaries, because you can learn not only from best practices, but also from worst practices. If you learn what hasn't worked, uh, it will also help you not to make the same mistakes that others have made already. I think today's discussions also contributed to address questions related to how can our uh, development agencies help to strengthen innovation ecosystems and enhance partnerships for innovation. Um, sharing a vision that innovation needs to add value, all the organizations represented um, share one additional common factor. They all agree that the most important thing is to create a space for innovation to take place and that space can take different forms and shapes. I fondly remember the uh, innovation lab that I once saw in the Australian Development Corporation Administration, which was uh, an absolute fantastic safe space for innovation and uh, things like that we can copy for other organizations as well. If I want to summarize some of the lessons learned, well, first, development agencies should focus on providing support to the demand side of innovation. We need to um, focus on finding solutions to problems based not on our assumptions of what the best solution could be, but on evidence and on the feedback that we receive from, from the end users, from the beneficiaries for which we are undertaking the whole effort. Secondly, we need to plan for all stages of innovation. Too many efforts are focused till now on the origination of ideas, and sometimes we are failing to bundle innovations and to scale them up afterwards. We're just facing the problem at IFAD where we had a fantastic innovation challenge and now are struggling uh, to find the funding to, to further develop the ideas that came up during the challenge. Third point, our agencies should also endeavor to deliver public good innovations that allow for replication and um, uh, the optimization of resources. And then next point, um, our agencies must also aim to understand the local context and the priorities of our partner governments to ensure that the innovations address not what maybe an international agencies might perceive as the local need, but the real local needs and also take into consideration what the local capacities are um, um, in, in, in a sustainable, accessible, and also affordable manner. Fifth point, we need to provide access to funding, but that's not enough. When thinking of uh, supporting innovation, we also need to address the need for capacity building and for technical assistance to support the teams during their whole uh, innovation pathway. And then next point, um, development agencies also need to be aware of the legal and financial framework within country um, uh, governments to design interventions that allow innovations to be scaled up through blended finance, through public-private partnerships, through strategic co-funding, um, just uh, uh, to quote a few, a few examples. Um, Next point, our agencies also play a key role analyzing, collecting, and disseminating good practices for the benefit of the innovation ecosystem. That's something we can really build upon. We also heard today about the importance of diversity and inclusivity, because that will enhance the chances of uh, success at innovating. So our teams should have not just the technical skills and not just the ability to think creatively and analytically research by leading academia has shown that diversity of thought and background equity and inclusivity um, lead to healthy debates that result in real solutions to um, challenging problems the team should also have the ability to focus on their innovation projects with clear objectives and clear milestones when the teams are distracted by too many other responsibilities, um, innovation might suffocate and the likelihood of failure, even of, of, of perfect ideas would increase. So we need to give space. Innovation teams should also not be expected to succeed or deliver their results in, in traditional ways. We must endeavor to create spaces where there is also freedom to fail. Beyond the proof of concept and prototyping, we must provide ample funding, ample funding for the execution of ideas. That's costly, but uh, teams that struggle to obtain funding or to receive funding in a timely manner for the execution of their ideas will fail to produce much 
and organizations would risk wasting precious resources that they invested in the early stages of innovation if then later on the innovation cannot continue properly. And then finally, and, and most importantly, our agencies play a fundamental role to advocate so that the needs of the most vulnerable groups are addressed through the innovations that we are funding and supporting. That is something we also need to keep in mind. We look forward to continue this dialogue, uh, this dialogue on, on, on innovation, on partnership to support the development of solutions and transformational change, a systematic and user-centric approach to innovation. And strategic planning during all the stages of innovation can effectively contribute to mitigate risks and to increase the effectiveness of innovation. And therefore, in the end, and that's the most important for us in IFAD, also our impact on, on SDGs 1 and 2. We committed to double our impact. And without innovation, I think we will not be able to manage. Many thanks to all of you again. It was a pleasure to um, attend this meeting. And uh, I hope we, we meet again in another innovation talk um, um, not too far in the future. Thank you so much, Dominique, for being with us, for distilling a very rich conversation uh, really well. It is much appreciated, and we're really happy to see many of the factors that you mentioned coming together at IFAD. Um, you also gave me a very next, nice segue, segue, saying, you know, the next uh, innovation talk at IFAD. That is actually coming up very soon, uh, and soon being next week. Uh, and the conversation will focus on digital agriculture and the role poor, challenges and opportunities in delivering results. And uh, Gladys and the team have done very well actually getting a Nobel Prize winner in economics to join. Professor Kramer will give the keynote, and then the CEO of Precision Agriculture for Development also joining. Um, and that will bring us to the end of this really interesting hour. I would have liked to continue the conversation. It was really fantastic. Um, thanks to all the speakers and panelists um, for sharing your experiences with us. Thank you to the entire CDI team at EFAT for putting this great session together. Special thanks also to all the colleagues behind the scenes. We can't do it without you. You are much appreciated. And then uh, finally, and of course, last not but not least, a big thank you to all the colleagues who joined and brought questions and uh, participated in the session. We can't do it without you either. Thanks for being with us and uh, wishing you a very good rest of the day. Until next time. Bye bye. Thanks all. Thank you. That's great.